I knew the parable that I was going to speak about because we've been talking about parables as a series. And I call it the, the, the parables in the red because all of it's talking about Jesus. So for the last few weeks, we have done nothing but talk about Jesus' teachings except for James Corder was with us and, and the mission things been interspersed. And by the way, I really love the way we've done it this year. We don't just take one day and two days of one weekend. We made a month long of missions and, and we're looking forward to that. And, and next week we will, we will kind of bring that all together with not just another parable teaching, but, but also the, the uh, Feast of Nations banquet and everything. I hope that you'll sign up, bring your favorite dish on there, and uh, we all feast together on that. But, um, but let me start off asking you a question. When was the last time you lost anything? Now stop and think. I'm serious. When was the last time you lost anything? I'm going to turn this on so we can get you. Who can remember losing something? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. When's the last time? Uh, last week. <laughs> Come on. Who, who's lost something around here? Last time? Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> what about you, Selma? Wait till you're my age. You'll find out. <laughs> last time you lost something? Your kids lost something this morning, okay? Some, when's the last time you lost something, Sid? This week. This week. Anybody lose something this morning? Okay, when's the last time? Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay, so, so all of us can agree, all of us have lost something. Anybody here never lost anything? Anybody here lost their minds? Okay. Okay, that, is, that, that makes a lot of sense because you never found it yet. Okay, so, okay, so here, here we go. All right. Now, you lost something. How many of you have ever lost something of value? Let me see your hand. Maybe it's your keys representing your car or your house. Maybe it's your wallet. Maybe it's a credit card. Who's lost something of value, and what did you lose? What did you lose? Come on, raise your hand up. I lost my wallet about four or five years ago. found it in my side beside my seat in the console. What about you, Louise? You lost a diamond earring. Somebody else. Who lost something? Yeah, Kelsey. All right. Paul. Uh, I lost my wedding ring for like a week, <laughs> and it turned out it was under my contact lens cap. I Didn't did. that hurt your eye? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not the lens, Pastor, the, the cap. Oh, the cap. Okay, okay. I thought. <laughs> Some, somebody else. Somebody that lost something of value. Anybody lost money or anything like that? Yeah, I lost my wallet with like $600 in it. Never found it. Never what? Never found it. Was it brown? <laughs> no, no. no. I lost my passport. You lost your passport. Penny. You lost your cell phone. Okay, so, so all of us seem to have lost something. Some of us have lost some stuff of really value. Some of us have found. How many have lost stuff and never found it? of value or anything else. How many have lost stuff and found it? Okay, when you lose something and you never find it, that's a bummer. When you lose something and you find it, what's that, how does that make you feel? Great, excited, you know. I've lost keys and then, and then months later I find them. You know, and I guess I would feel more joyous over it except the fact I spent the money to replace them. Right? Anybody ever lost your car? Somebody ever steal your car? Not lost it. Okay. Anybody ever been in a parking lot at Christmas time and lose your car? How, how, many, how many feel really joyful when you find it? Sure. Sure. Well, what I'm saying is, is, is that this morning, we're, we're talking kind of in those circles right here. Um, Turn with me to Luke chapter 15. I may be sharing with you this morning probably the most important message I've shared with you this entire year, in my opinion. And so please, if you can, take notes. Please, if you can, listen closely to what I'm saying because this is something that the Holy Spirit has done and sharing with me the last couple of weeks I've kind of shared this last week and, and during our Wednesday night verse-by-verse verse teaching that chapter is talking about. 
But turn with me to Luke 15 verses. We're going to start out verse 11 and 12. This is the parable on the prodigal son. Verse 11. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls or is to be given to me. And he divided unto them his In Israel, the older son received two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger son received one-third of the inheritance. That's just the way it was. It was the law, the Jewish law. It would automatically go to the sons upon death, but the father had the right, if he ever retired, to go ahead and give them their portions. Most of them never did that, but waited till death. Only in the most extreme circumstances would they give their inheritance to their sons while they were still living. It was considered rude and it was considered something you just should not do, a lack of honor. Okay? So, in this particular scripture, the younger son wants his inheritance. His father's neither dead nor was he really ready to give it over to his sons. But he demanded it because he wanted out of there. He had his life he wanted to live. He's independent. He didn't want to stay there anymore. He didn't want to be around his parents anymore. He didn't want to be around the job anymore. He didn't want to be around the parents' business anymore. He didn't want to be around anything. He said, I want my inheritance now. Verse 13. Not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country and wasted his substance on riotous or rebellious living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. Okay, so Jewish custom tells us that a man, or the law in Jewish law tells us that cursed is the man that feeds swine, because swine or pigs are considered under Jewish law a unclean animal. They would have nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, they were so despised. Remember the demonic person that had these legions of demons in him when Jesus exercised the demons out of him? Who were the fortunate recipients of all those demons? The pigs. Because they were so despised and looked down upon, and then at doing so, they, they became possessed, came into a frenzy, ran over the cliff, and all drowned. Verse 16. He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, you might underline that, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I'm, I'm here starving. I will arise and go forth to my father and will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He got up, came to his father, and when he was a great ways off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the father said unto him, Son, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. The son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight am no more worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. Okay, so he comes to his senses and he, and he says, Man, I, the, the servants are eating better than I am. I'm about ready to sit here and eat the pig slop that I'm feeding the pigs. This, this is not working out for me. I've lost everything. At least if I go back home and I'll tell my father, hey, look, you don't have to receive me back as a son. I know I messed up. I just want to live in your household again. I just want to experience your presence, your blessing. I just want to, I just want to be treated as a servant because servants are being treated better than I'm living right now, the way that I've done, the way I've messed up. He had reached the bottom, folks, and he had come to this place in his life where he realized maybe home wasn't so bad after all. And one of the things that I will give this guy credit for, and there's a couple of things, but one of the things is the fact that when he came to his senses, he just didn't continue to sit there in the pig waller. He didn't sit there and just keep making excuses and talk about how bad it was. He actually got up out of the pig pen and went back towards home. You need to remember this. And when he gets home, his father sees him. 
Now, the father doesn't set him down and do a couple of hours of talking and chewing him out. He doesn't tell him all the stupid things he done and why he should have done that. I told you so. What the father does is he, he sees him a long ways off, and, he, and, he, and he's been watching for this. He's been longing. His heart has been broken, and now he sees the semblance of it looks like a broken man. It wasn't quite as standing as tall as the person that left there, but it can tell that even from a far way off that was his son. And when he sees that that is his son, he comes back and he begins to do the things that are talked about, bringing a robe on him, putting a, putting a ring, a, which was an identification. It was a signet ring, a family crest, a family ring. All the family members had it. And then, and then they put shoes on his feet. Now, I want to focus on the shoe for just a minute because he was not wearing shoes when he came back from where he was. He was not wearing shoes when he came back from his rebellion, from living a life of sin and riotousness. He had no shoes at all. Now, back at the time that they're talking about, slaves did not wear shoes. When you were, when you were in a family, when you were the, the head, the master of the family, or you were a family member, yes, you wore shoes, but slaves never wore shoes, nor were masters ever supposed to give them shoes in the Jewish economy. Because people can see by their bare feet that they were slaves, that they served someone else. How many got that? So the son says, hey, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just call me servant such and such or servant Joe or slave Joe. I'm okay with that. But what's the father say? Here's what he says. Put some shoes on him. Put some shoes on that guy, on that boy, on my son. No, no, I'm not worthy. I'm a slave. We don't wear shoes. Only the family. Put some shoes on him. And if you look at the dialogue they had before he said that, there wasn't a lot of conversation because the father's heart was filled with compassion and the father's heart was longing for him. And the father's heart wanted better for him. But notice he never left the porch going out looking for him. Notice he didn't send people out looking for him. But however, he was diligent. He was diligent expecting him to come back. Why was the son barefooted? Because his sonship, Satan stole from him the shoes and the position and the relationship that he had with his father and family, took him out of there, left him to die, left him to starve, and he was no more than a slave to sin when he was in the world where he even lost the shoes, the identification, the representation that he belonged to a family and was worthy of a pair of shoes. When people are in the world, they, they might as well take their shoes off because then they're serving Satan because now they're a slave to Satan. They don't even have the shoes they used to have. They don't even walk the same way they used to walk. They don't even, they don't even have the same type of relationship they used to have if they once knew God and fallen from him. Now we get to verse 23 and 24. I may love the word, amen. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son, not a slave, was dead. The Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. So we know that he was a sinner. And is alive again. He was lost. Who? The prodigal. The lost son. And now is found. And they began to be merry. What that means is they began to have a party. They began to have a tremendous party. They celebrated because the son had come home and had been brought back into the family. Now, this is one of three parables in this chapter that all are referring and talking about a specific point that you need to hear today. Because your goal and my goal as Christians should not just be live this life out, endure all the junk we have to put up with and hope we make it to the end. That is not what we're here for. Our goal is to represent Christ that not only we go to heaven, but we can take some people with us, say a good amen. And I think the first people we should be trying to take with us are our family. I believe the first people, let's not, let's not win the world and lose our families. That came to me in an earth shattering, a quaking way one night when I was, when I was coming home after a long day 
and I had taken my shoes off and I was getting ready to settle in and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and my mother was in the hospital and said, go see your mom. I said, no, I'll see her tomorrow. I just saw her yesterday. Just, he said, no, go see her now. So I got in that night. I went in there. I had to go through the emergency room and go up into the, where she was staying and, I, and I, was, I went in there. She wasn't expecting me. And I, and I said to her, I said, hey, Mom, how you doing? She said, what are you doing here? She says, it's too late. You should be home with, with Kim, and you should be home. With, this is what you should be doing. I said, no, no, because she thought about herself a lot, you know. Not others a lot, not me. I mean, let me put the, she thought about others, not herself a lot. And, um, and I, I looked at her because I knew she had been here a lot of times and, and I knew that she had been going to church with my sister and I knew that she was very accepting. My father had received the Lord and, and here at the church and, and, and uh, my family, were, which were once very, very uh, against me following, being a Christian, following anything, being in a ministry especially, they were totally against it. My mom was brought up Buddhist. My dad was brought up nothing, basically. He said that their family was Baptist, but I don't know any indication of that. Went to church five times in 21 years, and three of them were in one week for vacation Bible school to get the cookies and look at girls. <laughs> hey, can we be honest? That's what you did. Okay, so, so I sat there and I said, hey, Mom, I got something to ask you. I said, you know, I've been to Africa and I've been to Mexico and I've been to all these places and seen a lot of people get saved and all this, and I know you've been, I said, can I ask you a question? I... I I got to know because I can't, are you, are you saved? She said, no. So I'm sitting there looking at my mother, telling me she's not saved, and I can think of all the times I've seen her, all the messages she's heard, all the times she's gone to church, and I said, how could that be? I said, Mom, how could that be? All the times you've gone to church and all the times you've, you've heard the message and, and you, know, you saw Dad get saved and the change in his life, how could that be that you're not saved? Because, see, in my heart, I was thinking, man, after preaching and sharing this with everybody for a long time, different parts of the United States and the world, surely my family's okay. She said, you never asked me. And I looked at it, my preaching was asked, and I said, well, maybe somebody else has asked her, even though she's never really come to an altar. Maybe she came with my sister, maybe she did, but she's never been opposed to it. She's been nice about it. She hasn't been critical of it and everything ever since, for a long time. And I said, what do you mean I never asked you? You've never asked me to get saved. And it broke me. I said, but I gave altar calls and invite. That was them. I'm your mother. I, I said, I'm so sorry, and I can remember I was, I was tearing up bad, and I, I said, look, that's a mistake on my part, but I want to get this taken care of right now. So it was, it was my privilege that night to lead her to the Lord, and less than a week later, she was dead. She turned for the worse unexpectedly the next day. Just got three days later, actually, she was dead. Okay, so, so God gave me a chance and God gave me an opportunity and I'm, I'm afraid that so many times there may be people living in our home and people were around and, and that, that's maybe that God has put in our path and we have not, we, we know what we're supposed to, we just neglected, we thought somebody else, we thought because they carried a Bible, went to church with us or watched Christian television and listened, we thought they were saved, but, but we never really knew. Listen, if there are people out there that you don't know, ask them. If they're saved, they won't be mad at you. They won't be mad at you. But you ask them because it shows that they care. How many see what I'm talking about? Amen? So in verse 15, verses 1 and 2, in the same chapter, Jesus talks about this small parable, and he says, hey, look, uh, that, uh, that first of all, the Republicans and sinners there to hear him, and there were Pharisees and scribes there, and the Pharisees and scribes said that this man teaches sinners and eats with them. They, in other words, there were two groups of people. There were Republicans and sinners. These people in the scriptures always seem to be the ones coming to Jesus, inquisitive, wanting to know more, and eventually getting saved. Matthew and Zacchaeus were publicans, tax collectors. They were despised and hated by the Jewish people. However, they came to Jesus freely and because there was something about Jesus that gave them hope. 
Something about Jesus they, they, they can grab onto and have hope and be inspired. And they came to Jesus looking, searching for hope and received it. But then there's these other, these other guys, these Pharisees and these, and these scribes. They did not come to Jesus for hope. They came looking for something to trip Jesus up with. They, they, they didn't come for changed life. They came to prove him not right, to discount him, to disqualify, to dishonor him. So they came, and, and the first thing they do is say, ah, look, he's eating with sinners. Ah, what kind of person is that? No, no. Stop and think with me. If you are a Christian, what they weren't, or a righteous person, which they claim to be, and they were open to the gospel, or they were open, in their case, to the Old Testament and believing in Yahweh, wouldn't you think it would be a great thing for them to sit there and listen to what you had to say? Instead, the scribes and Pharisees were so critical that he was sitting there eating with them, talking to them about the gospel, talking to them about the kingdom. They were critical that he was sharing this great news with these scummy people. So their attitudes were terrible, terrible. So he says this parable. So this shepherd has 99 sheep. One of them leaves and gets lost. But the shepherd pins up. I'm just adding a little to it because I think is what happens. He just let him roll. He pins up the 99, goes and finds the one sheep that's lost. When he finally finds it and brings it home, they all begin to celebrate. And he says, it's like that in heaven. When somebody is lost, when someone is lost and they're brought back home, everybody rejoices in heaven. Okay, simple understand. Everybody's happy. There's a celebration when a loss comes out. Then he goes on with the second parable, verses 8 through 10. And he talks about this. He said, there's a woman that had 10 pieces of silver, 10 silver coins. She loses one of the silver coins. She can't find it. So she turns on the light. She begins to do some intense cleaning. She sweeps the floor. She diligently looks for that coin and finds it. And then likewise, after she finds it, she calls all of her neighbors and all of her friends. Who knows? Maybe she said, please pray for me for wisdom. Help me to find it. I don't know what she's saying. But anyway, she calls them and lets them know, hey, I found it. And there's another celebration because they found the lost coin great celebration so so far two out of two celebrations after finding something lost and then jesus comes back and he tells this parable of the of the prodigal son that's lost and the prodigal son guess what happens at the end of this uh, this thing when he's found they have another celebration just like the first two they have a celebration for the prodigal son how many are following what jesus is doing what he's trying to do is, try to, is actually trying to really speak the intent of this whole chapter, this whole message of these three parables to the scribes and Pharisees. He's trying to say, look, there needs to be a celebration, not a scrutiny. There needs to be joy, not a criticism, when somebody is lost and becomes found. When somebody gets saved, don't stand around and go, I wonder how long that'll last. Maybe it'll stick, maybe it won't. No, 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 no. When somebody gets saved, take it at face value and say, thank you, Jesus, for touching their life. I guarantee you, if you were an honorary person growing up and you came to the Lord, somebody out there said, well, that ain't going to last long. I guarantee you, that's what somebody said about you. And then when you're still serving God now after all these years, you just blow them away. It's not ours to judge the validity of what they're doing. Their fruit will bear out eventually what's going on. But it's ours to have joy when somebody truly repents and comes to the Lord. Now, how do you say truly repents? Because I don't know if somebody's truly repenting except afterwards how they live their life. Because if you don't live your life according to the repentance that you're professing, that means your life's not changed. Because repentance is a reflection of a changed life. No changed life equals no repentance. Come on, somebody. Now, I'm sharing this with you this morning because I'm about ready to get to the meat of something right here. And like I said, I believe this is the most important message I preached all year long. So keep going with me. All three parables have a response. Joy and celebration when someone is found. So the guy hits rock bottom of the prodigal son. He's about to ready to eat with the pigs comes to his senses and say, I'll go back and be a servant at my dad's house. I'll be a servant, not a son anymore. Maybe he'll take me in. Turns home, 
repents to his father. This is huge. Ask him to come home not as a son but as a servant. Now we don't know how long his father has been waiting out there. We don't really know how many days, weeks, months, or years it is till he makes this trip back home after he leaves. We just know that there's some time that's taken place. It may have been a week, a month, a year, who knows? Well, verse 20 says, while he's a still a far away off, the father is looking down that road. While he's a great way off, the father who represents the symbol of our Heavenly Father, and you and I, prior to being a Christian, represent that prodigal. The Father was looking a long way down the road off for us, looking for our return, looking for us to come back. Return, I've never been there before. I've never been a Christian. Oh, but you don't understand. Before Adam and Eve fell, there was a special relationship they had with God that they lost after they sinned. And God wants to bring you into that special relationship that they lost through his son Jesus Christ when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, like the woman with the lost coin and like the man with the lost sheep, they threw him a party because they were happy that he returned. So I want to ask you, what do you do when you have a prodigal in your life? And we know what the Heavenly Father does. He's looking out, believing the best for us. But what do you do when there's a prodigal in your home, a spouse, a son, a daughter, a friend, a family member? What do you do if there's a prodigal in your life? And I hope that you listen to this. I hope you listen closely because I, I was so moved by, by, by sharing this on Wednesday night that I looked Thursday and Friday. I looked back at it again. It just, it just shook me inside because it was a revelation a revelation is something that God gives you that goes down deep. It just doesn't go in one inner out the other. If you'll grab this this morning, I believe you're going to start seeing changes in people's lives around you that need Jesus. How many need that? Let me see your hand. So what do you do when you're in this situation you have a prodigal? Time is it? Oh. Well, I pray. Absolutely you pray. Great. Well, what do you pray? Oh, Lord, save such and such. I don't believe God can answer that prayer. What? Had a woman yesterday tell me, when you said that on Wednesday night, I said, that's wrong. Of course he can. Then when you explain why, according to Scripture, I went, oh, my gosh. I've been, I've been blowing it all this time. He, he can't even answer that prayer. Oh, Lord, save... John, Mary, Joe, Tony, save him, save him. No, he can't answer your prayer. Now, before you get mad at me, let me explain why he can't answer that prayer. You and I have been created in the image of God. Doesn't that say that in, in, in Genesis? How many remember that? Let's see your hand. You've been created in the image of God. God is what they call self-determinant. He has the ability to make choices and free will has a, and he's given man because we're created in his image, the self-determined attitude, also this, the free will agency of God is what you've been taught to have, the ability to make choices. And based upon the choices that I make and you make because God's given us this free will, it determines our ultimate destiny because our choices determine our destiny. So God respects the fact that he has given you the ability to make a choice. That's what he respects. The fact that he's given you an ability to make a choice. Follow me? God gave Adam and Eve the ability to make a choice. He did not force them and tell them what to do. God gave you and me the ability to make a choice. He's not forcing us and telling us how to look. We're not robots doesn't take that away from us and as long as we are in the image of God which we are created in then God is always going to keep the self-determinant ability to make a choice for us I mean in us not for us how many follow me so far if God should stop and say one day I'm going to make them do that there's no choice that's I don't care if it is against their will I'm going to do it we are no longer as the scripture said created in this image because we no longer have the ability to make our own choices if God's making them for us follow me 
That's why when you pray, oh, God, save John, Robert, Brian, Delbert, save them. He's going, I can't. Why? Because they will to live like that. They will and make the choices to live like that. I cannot violate their will when they have chosen to live like that. I can't do it. Because they're created in my image and I love them so much I give them the ability to make choices. And these are the choices that they make and this is the destiny that they have. Now, God respects the fact that he has given you the ability to have a choice. You catching this? God respects the fact, Tom. God respects the fact. Said that he, I've given you the ability to make a choice. I'm not going to make you do that against your choice. Because that would take that away. It would nullify the, what I gave you. But that does not mean just because he respects the fact he's given you this ability that he respects what you have chosen. God respected the fact that he gave Adam and Eve the ability to make a choice, gave them instructions not to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because the day that you eat thereof you sh- and touch it, you shall die. He gave them the warning But he still gave them the opportunity to make the choice and not make them not touch it, not make them not eat it. So when they touched and they ate the fruit and violated the will of God, God respected the fact that he gave them the ability to make choices, but he did not respect the choice that they made and they were taken out of the garden. Did God ever stop loving them? No, he loved them anyway. He loved them all through the time, even when they were let out of the garden. Has God ever stopped loving you? No, he's loved you since he's seen you in your mama's womb. But he does not respect the choices that you make, even though he respects the fact he has given you the ability to make choices. How many follow me? Say a good amen. amen. The prodigal father respected the fact that... There's an inheritance, and I will give it to him. That's not a problem. He has a choice what he does with it. He can choose. But he did not respect the fact of what he chose. There are parents that have children that that they say, well, I'm going to give them a bunch of room. Well, part of this is growing up. Part of this is training them the right way. But the bottom line is eventually they will have to make their own decisions to create their own destiny. And you will have to come to a point in time where you look and say, I do not respect your choices. Just like the Lord says, I don't respect your choices, especially the rebellious and sinful choices. He does not respect them, though he give us the ability to make those a choice. So if a man, if God respects the choices that a man makes, even though he doesn't respect what they do, you can't pray, God save this man when the man's choice is not to be saved because his choices are living like an unsaved person and, and believing like an unsaved person. He's not going to force him to be a saved person. Please grab this because if you have unsaved people in your life, you need to know, you need to stop praying like that because it's not holding water. I'm going to give you some scripture in a minute. Because you can't violate that person's free will choice to live that way if that's the way they want to live. Unless a a prodigal asks God for salvation and repents, he can't be saved. That means he must, in his own mind, willfully decide to receive and follow Jesus. That's the only way. He must willfully repent. He must willfully ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of life. Now, now, Satan creates a dilemma for us then. There's, so if I can't pray asking God to save such and such, how am I supposed to pray? And there's a scripture that covers this, that covers it perfectly. Matthew 18, 18. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Satan has blinded and binded the minds of people 
with his prejudice and his poison and his lies. He's blinded them. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this. Listen closely. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which are not believers so that the glorious gospel or the good news of Christ can't shine unto them. It cannot shine unto them because Satan has put blinders from being able to see the glory of it. Blinders from being able to see what it means. The closest thing I can come to this is, is maybe, uh, 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 let me help with an illustration. Carrie, come up here for a second, will you? And, and uh, Robert, come here for a second. Okay. Suppose I am representing with my voice, the voice of God. And this guy's walking along in the world, right? He's walking along in the world. And then he's going to represent the blinders that, that Satan puts on people, okay? So he's walking along in the world. Put your hands over his eyes, just like this. No, no. Put your hands over his eyes, both eyes. Get behind him. Now, and you... So he's walking... But Satan has blinded him and cannot, he can't even hear. Rational, common sense. He can't hear the glory. You're saying, can't you pick this up what the gospel says? It's saying that, that if, you're, if you're a sinner and you want Jesus, you want to be forgiven, all you got to do is trust him, give your life. He died on the ground. And you're going, yeah, 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 why can't anybody get this? Because he can't hear it and he can't see it and it can't get to his heart. An unsaved person can't hear it, can't see it, cannot get to his heart. They're blinded. But if this, if this influence says to him, walk three steps forward. Walk three steps forward. Walk two steps forward. Walk two steps forward. <laughs> walk two more steps forward. Don't you reckon that that influence knows what's going on? And he knows what he's getting ready to do to them? But if God's here going, listen, the gospel says you can be free. The gospel says it can save you and free you. But he can't hear that because his ears are, and he can't see. It's not that the gospel can't do it, but it says in 2 Corinthians that Satan has blinded their minds and hearts from receiving the glorious gospel, thereby they can be saved and set free. The message can't even get to them. Because of the influence that they have on a personal life. You know people that you're saying, I don't know why they're not getting this. They know that it's hopeless to be an alcoholic. They know that drugs are going to kill them. They know that what they're doing is going to kill them. I want to tell you why your common sense, your gospel doesn't do anything with that person. Because they are blinded and they can't hear. And their hearts cannot receive what you're saying because Satan has done that. It's like having a blind spell put all over you. Now... Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When we pray and we bind this blindness, this influence, this control and this power of the enemy off of their lives, that the glory and the voice and the Holy Spirit can speak to their hearts where they can receive it, speak to their ears where they can hear it, speak to the spirit man that they can receive it, what happens is this. Now you can see where you're at. <laughs> the problem is, when no one's praying that, when no one's standing in the gap, put your hands, what they're praying again is, oh, save Carrie. Oh, save Carrie. And Carrie can't hear you. The gospel's not getting to you. It's not doing it. Why? Because they're still bound. There's, there's, how many hear what I'm saying? That's what's going on in your life and families in your prodigal sons and daughters and your husbands and wives and, and family and friends. But when you bind, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command you by the blood in the name of Jesus Christ to loose your power and control and hold off of his life that the glory of the God, and I loose the power of the Spirit of God through the name and blood of Jesus Christ to have an effect on his life, to push back the darkness, the demons, the things that are, and, and, and he begins to do this. When you begin to pray like he's going... And you create a space 
for the gospel to be able to come and penetrate him. Prayer just gives us a space for them not to be influenced like they were being influenced, but they still have a free will decision to do something with the gospel. If they do not do anything with the gospel, then it won't be long. There he is again. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Or if we once knew the Lord and we were willfully sinning against him in rebellion, we are saying, come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Riotous, rebellion, drunkenness, adultery. Come on back. And we're going, but I go to church. But you know, the gospel's not getting in you. You're not really hearing the gospel. You're hearing what you want to hear. And if you don't hear what you want to hear, you go someplace that will preach what you want to hear. See what I'm saying? Thank you, God. Give these guys a hand. <laughs> Ever notice how when people seem to be nice and friendly and when you talk to them about the chiefs or you talk to them about the weather but there's two things when, when you talk to them about they're not necessarily nice and they're violent about, politics and Jesus. Ever notice that? You can talk to them and everything, but you start talking about Jesus and that nice person says, oh, yeah, how's your team doing? Yeah, 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 I'm in this league and I'm on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you start talking about Jesus and all of a sudden, what do you mean telling me about Jesus? You keep your Jesus. And they give you the hard time. What is going on with them? They're not rational. They can't be rational as long as Satan's blocked their hearing, blocked their spiritual vision, blocked the gospel from able to get in because he has bound them. They can't be rational because they can't receive what you have to say because of the influence and control of Satan. Oh, that's not true. Am I not my little honey or not my little boy, not my wife, not my husband? Are you kidding me? Are you smarter than this word? If you are, then just shut it and live your life. If not, listen to what it has to say and stop being blocked. Because the only freedom and hope we have is in this gospel, in this good news. And as long as we're going to pick and choose the verses we want, we're basically telling God, these are the verses I don't want to listen to. And eventually those will become more and more and more verses, more and more and more areas, and then we will be totally blind and totally blocked from hearing the truth, and our lives will cease to live and look like Jesus. Oh, Satan, can't, he'll wait. He'll wait a month. He'll wait a year. He'll wait two years to see you gradually fall away. He doesn't necessarily want it to happen this week or next week. See, Satan does not respect your choice for being a Christian. God respects your choice, and God respects the fact he's given your choice. But Satan doesn't respect your choice of being a Christian. That's why when you say you're a Christian, he tells you, no, you're not. That's why when, he says, when you say you're a Christian, he starts to tempt you and go, no, you're not. You just thought about that. That means you're not saved. You just thought about that. You're just a bad person. You just started thinking about what you can do when you're by yourself. You just thought about what you can do with your money when nobody looks. Even though you've done nothing, he's throwing all these things into you because he did not respect the fact that you made a choice to follow God. He, all he understands is I got to get to them and blind them. I got to keep them out of heaven. And then to keep them out of heaven, all I got to do is keep them away from Jesus and the gospel, the good news of Christ. So this diligent father was waiting for his son. And I think we as diligent fathers and mothers, and I think we, we should be doing something about our prodigals too. Not neglecting them, not just using a blind excuse, oh, they'll grow up, they'll grow out of it. No, no, listen. The things your kids are doing at 8, 9, and 10 years old, if they're not straight now, they're going to be amplified and made worse by the time they're 12, 16, 18, 20, 25, 30, 45, 50. The influence that you're having on them right now, and you think, well, isn't that cute? Or the things you're not doing you know you should do, you're planning in them that they can do the same thing. And eventually they're going to be blind. They don't want to hear the gospel. It doesn't make sense. They won't believe all of it because Satan is waiting right there to throw this lack of rationality at them. The gospel 
It appeals to intellectual people, but the gospel is not about intellect. The gospel is about spirit. The gospel is about heart. The gospel is about you. You can go to school and be made intellectual, but you can't fix stupid. How many of you know what I'm saying? And far as Jesus is concerned, there are a lot of people sitting around today professing to be Christians, but they're intellectually stupid when it comes to Christ because they do not have a relationship with them, and they can quote you every verse in here but still not have a relationship. Somewhere, it's got to be able to get inside you to start making changes. And the only way that can happen is by binding the powers that are controlling their lives, the blindness, the prejudice, the poison that Satan's creeped into them and tempted them with and allowed there to be a loose of God's spirit, the Holy Spirit to begin to work in their lives. How many hear what I'm saying? Amen? Yes. 2 Timothy 2.26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, the devil who has taken them captive by his own will. What's that saying? Satan can take you captive by his own will without Jesus. What do you mean? He'll work on you and work on you and work on you and work on you without Jesus in your life. He, he, he sees a free open road. Now, with Jesus in your life, he'll still work on you. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes even harder. But the bottom line is, he, what I get out of that verse is, he just lets go on me at his will, whatever he wants to do. He may lay off for a week or a season, then he'll come back and just bombard me. How many know what I'm talking about? He's thinking, this is my game, my rules. I can do whatever I want to that person. They have no choice. That's what he's saying. You have no choice. You will always be a drug addict. You will always be an adulterer. You will always be an alcoholic. You will always be negative. You will always have anger. You will always do that. And some people have listened to that lie because, because the gospel's not penetrating them. They're hearing it, it's not going in. And they're going, you know what? I must have been born like that. I'm made like that. So I'm guessing I'm always going to be like that. That's the way God. No, God did not make you to be an adulterer, an alcoholic, a drug addict. He did not make you that way. It's by our choices that our destiny has occurred and will occur. And God's not going to make those choices. We make them. So do you have a prodigal in your life today? Maybe you're a prodigal. Maybe you're the result of somebody been praying and binding and, and you find yourself now at this place where you're going, I really need to make that choice for Jesus and Maybe somebody's been praying for you and has pushed back that influence and that control just, just enough with the gospel sinking and going, oh, I get it this morning. Well, that's because somebody's been praying for you. That's because the gospel, you, you're ready to receive what God has for you. Maybe you're that parent that needs to start praying correctly. You're saying, do you really think that's absolutely, I would not spend the time with you on one Sunday, give up one fifty-second of this year on Sundays to spend a message that means nothing. I don't have time for that. But I have all the time in the world to share with you the truth that will set you free, set your prodigal free, and see people come to the Lord. You start out, you bind the work. Whatever you bind on earth is bound to heaven. We happen to be living on earth. Satan is called the prince of the palate of the powers of the air. Whatever we bind on earth would be bound in heavens or he's in like the first and second heavens is where he does his damage. The air we breathe and right above there. So we bind that negative. We bind that control. We, we bind that blindness, specifically the blindness from hearing, the blindness from seeing, blindness from receiving the God. We bind his effect and by the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, we break the controlling power of it from their life. Now, I'm not going to fool you. You say, well, how do you pray that once? No, you pray that until you see it broken. It's kind of like the little kid at Christmas time. When are you going to stop asking me for that toy doll until I get it? Right? That's what I'm talking about. And so you say, because the, this says that the, there's the blood of Jesus, 
that washes away and breaks the power. And there's a name of Jesus that every knee shall bow in, every demon shall bow, and every tongue confess. This ultimate king of king and lord. And through that name and through that power and through that blood, we squelch, we wipe out, we break those controlling powers and those spirits that would be so that there is an openness and a non-controlling of them by the, by the devil. So they are open. And what do we do? We loose in the name of Jesus the ability for the gospel to penetrate their hearts and minds and eyes. We loose in the name of Jesus the power of the Holy Spirit according to God's word. Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. In the name of Jesus, we loose that in their lives right now. No more of this, oh, save so-and-so. That didn't get off the ground because Satan got him. Can you pray that a little louder? That's what he's saying because he knows it means nothing. Because you haven't addressed the issue. Something's controlling them. The hard part for you if you're a mom and dad is you, don't, you have the hard time to believe that even at an early age, things can influence and control your children, but they can our kids are really smart. They're smart enough to be smart when they want to be and smart enough to act dumb when they need to be. Come on. So I'm going to ask you a question. If you're here today, you've just heard this message, and if you happen to hear it and you are not a Christian, you're not living for God then what has happened is the blood in the name of Jesus. Somebody's prayed for you. Or even as we bound in this message, in this service, as I bound in the name of Jesus, those things, it has affected you and it pushed back away, and now you rationally see, I need Jesus. Look, who would not rationally accept the promise of God of having eternal life, sins forgiven, not have to die and suffer all eternity, to live as a free man and woman? Who would not want that? Oh, I want to be bound. Oh, I want to go to hell. Oh, I want to suffer. No, you don't. It's because you are not rational. It's because you've been blinded. That's why you are not receiving. And the religious people, the scribes and Pharisees, they had all their intellectual modge podge, thought they had the answers, but why would they fight so hard if they really knew they had the answers? Why would they want to discredit this man, Jesus? Well, all the people are getting discredited. There have been prophets and other holy men before. Why all of them gang up on him? Because they knew. And even his presence convicted him. Even his presence convicted them. So bow your heads all over this place. Thank you for your patience. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Tony, I need, I needed, and I need exactly what you're saying. I need Jesus to come in and be the Lord. He needs to save my soul. No more of this acting one way and confessing another way. No more of this acting one way and saying I'm this way but not. I want to give my whole life to God and I want to, I want to live for, for him right now from now on. I'm not going to let the devil control me anymore. I'm not going to believe those lies he's been telling me. I'm always going to be an adulterer. I'm always going to be angry. I'm always going to be I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that no more. I'm going to live by his word. Now, if you don't plan on doing that, please don't respond because I, I don't want to make it worse for you than what it is. If you're going to lie, listen, I mean this with all... With a broken heart, I mean this. If you're going to lie, lie inside of church. Don't lie in church. But you're here today and you say, I need what you have, what God's sharing with you, and I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I need to make him the Lord and Savior. I want to invite Jesus to save me. If that's you, slip your hand up right now. I need Jesus. Lift it up high. I need Jesus. I need you. Come on, lift it up. There's somebody else. Who else? I need Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me all over this place? You that lifted your hands, I saw a couple of people. Would you come forward? Just come and join me up here. I'm not going to make a bit. I'm going to have somebody pray with you to pray with you right now. If you lifted your hands, come, and we're going to pray with you right now. Quickly. Quickly. Don't hold back. Now, the rest of you that are here this morning, you have somebody that's a prodigal, family or friend. 
don't you? We're going to pray and take the next 60 seconds. And when we get to that point in the beginning, Lord, I pray for, and you begin, and you just say that name. You don't have to shout it. You don't have to be violent. Just say that name. And we will pray together. If you don't know what to pray, listen and pray afterwards. We will agree together on this binding and loosing of the Spirit of God. Amen. Are you ready? You ready? Dear God, Dear God I pray right now for, and you fill in the blank, that in the name of Jesus, that name above every name, and by the blood of Jesus Christ, we pray that you would break the control and power of blindness upon him your name. We ask God that Satan would loose his hold because your spirit's so powerful. Your name is so great and your blood is real apply this to their life right now as we command Satan to back off loose himself from influence on their life now we loose in the name of Jesus that they would be receiving of the gospel that this blinding and binding would not have control on them. That the gospel would have entrance to bring light and life. And their lives would come to Jesus and not be affected therein. Thank you, Jesus, for loving this person. And I agree according to your word. As I have bound on earth and as, as I've loosed on earth, your word is honored. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for me, that's what you do. That's what Jesus said to do. And you do this until you see the this, this stranglehold start to shake off of them, that you begin to see changes in their life. For some of them, you'll know that it's working because they'll get meaner. What? They're already mean. No, they'll get meaner because they, they feel like something's attacking them. They feel like something's causing them to give up. Nobody wants to give up when you're full of pride. Nobody wants to give themselves over to anything, but it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Help us to employ this, your word, as we reach out to the prodigal families and friends that we have. Bless the Lord, we pray in Jesus' great name. And everybody say, if you have prayer needs and you'd like to be prayed for, we just ask for you to come forward. I have Cindy to pray and Brian to pray.